Welcome everyone. This is uh, our second guest speaker for the Modern Political Thought class. His name is Arthur Millick. He's uh, my old boss and uh, he has an MA from University of Chicago getting a PhD from Catholic. I told you last time that Professor Lynch was you know, the greatest uh, Machiavelli scholar of my generation. Well, the greatest Descartes scholar of my generation is dead. <laughs> but we have Arthur, uh, who's going who's gonna, who's gonna to come in and talk. He's an apple, not an orange. And uh, so we're just, really, I'm really happy to have him uh, come in and talk. Uh, Descartes, he was, he, he, he took a graduate class from the last generation's great uh, Descartes scholar uh, at Catholic. And so I'm happy to have him come and talk on Descartes. Like Professor Lynch, he's going to come in and talk today for about 40, 45 minutes on what Descartes' intention is, what the purpose of Descartes' thought is. Uh, he'll take questions after that for a while, and then, uh, and then we're going to uh, come in afterward and talk about the last part of Descartes, uh, just the class, uh, part six. So welcome Arthur Millick, and, uh, and there's his speech, like right on time, like it was planned, and uh, here we go. Thanks so much for having me, guys. Uh, let me just get a second here to find the right one. So, um, uh, first of all, I just want to say that you guys are very lucky to have Scott Yenner uh, as your professor. He's really uh, a wonderful person. He has a first-rate mind. And uh, you guys are all students in the university. And you know, universities, uh, just like everything, are up and down. You know, uh, there's good. There are ages and eras when universities are very prosperous, full of remarkable people, and then there are other eras. And uh, I think that right now we're in a kind of decline of the university, and there are very few people like Scott around. And so you guys are very lucky to have found him. Uh, I think that's great. Uh, I also want to say that uh, you guys have been studying the Descartes now, and you guys see that he's uh, he's always talking about his own life and tranquility, and trying to find tranquility. And he seems to find some tranquility in Amsterdam, he says, uh, to think, to free himself up to think. And that's what a university ought to be. Uh, and I live in DC, and DC is a, a town that is always on the move. Things are always changing. People are changing in it. Uh, the cycles of the elections make people change. The disappointment of ambitions make people change. People come and leave dashed hopes. And uh, Boise is a different place, and it's admirable for that reason. This is my second time here. Uh, I think that in, in a way, if you want, you can find the kind of tranquility and the kind of uh, uh, isolation that's necessary to develop the mind in the way that Descartes discusses it here, much more than in DC. DC is not a place for thinking. Um, uh, so our objective today is to grasp Descartes' influence. Uh, that is a big question, and we all kind of know that he's been influential. He's the originator of modern science uh, and of the modern understanding of philosophy. Uh, and in this last point, he is a follower, uh, an improver perhaps, but a follower of Machiavelli, who you guys have studied, and of Sir Francis Bacon, who you guys have uh, maybe not studied, but maybe heard of. Uh, they are all part of the same project. And they all understand themselves. Those that come after Machiavelli, they all understand themselves as being part of a project. And we'll discuss what, what it means to be part of a project. Why a project? Um, now, this may seem scholarly and distant, but it's not, as I'm going to try and prove to you guys today. Uh, Descartes is actually, um, he affects our lives uh, very deeply and thoroughly. And so deeply, I think, that we may not even notice. So we have to dig. We have to dig uh, uh, to the sort of depths as we're going to try to do, or some depths anyways, not the depths, but some depths of our understanding of ourselves and see that Descartes sits uh, at a kind of fundamental place of how we understand ourselves, how we understand uh, our relationship to eternity. We'll, we'll try and figure that out. So if we look around this, let's, in, in trying to figure out Descartes' influence, we have to kind of look first on the surface of things. Uh, very bold. <laughs> Uh, we have to look around us and, and, and find some of the unmistakable clues. And you know, it used to be said that you, you can understand God through his work and his creation. And in a similar way, you can understand Descartes 
through his uh, work and his creation. So what are the obvious things? Well, as I said, modern natural science and the mathematical physics that it's built on. Uh, and uh, this, this new science has brought innumerable things to our lives, which we just take for granted and we think are somehow just normal and spontaneous. Um, just uh, as a couple of examples, uh, does anybody here know uh, anybody that has had leprosy or cholera? No? Or smallpox or plague? Do you know somebody? One person. Do you know that, that person personally? Yes. One person. Um, these diseases are largely gone. Uh, they don't exist anymore. They exist in certain places in Africa, in East Asia, but for uh, modern regimes, they're totally gone. They're, they, they have gone from our um, horizons. We don't even reflect on them. Um, and in this, uh, this is uh, an, an achievement of Descartes, and specifically Descartes. Uh, his focus is on medicine. And we're going to try to figure out why medicine is so important in this intention, in this intentional project that he's launching. And one of the reasons, I want to give you guys a clue. One of the reasons is, and we, we, we should think about ourselves and how we feel about medicine. When we get sick, to whom do we turn? Like when a family member gets sick, do we turn to God and prayer? Or do we turn to science? Do we say that um, uh, when somebody dies, for example, another example, when somebody dies, do we say, uh, oh, uh, the ambulance just came too late, that person could have been saved, or the cure just wasn't found yet? Or do we say, no, God took them, there was intention there, it was their time? Uh, the, 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 we'll, we'll come back to this, but the question is, uh, how has science affected our fears and our hopes? And um, this is where uh, I think Descartes fits in very importantly uh, in, in redesigning how we think. Um, what about the other obvious forms of evidence that Descartes' project is real and has been successful? The machines that surround us, they fly, they drill, they swim, they go into space. All of these things are possible only because of mathematical physics. Um, uh, they have been, become possible only because of our new capacity to torture nature to figure out its secrets, and to use and channel its energies for our benefit. This all originates in Descartes. And our belief in a uh, progressive natural science, uh, our belief that science somehow possesses the truth, that it will progress, that its progress is uh, unlimited. We don't know what secrets it will unfold. Uh, this is all uh, Descartes. The institutions that surround us, the institution that you're in, it is a modern research university. Uh, its purpose is the discovery of the truth. Uh, especially through the sciences. The entire infrastructures that exist for these purposes. Governments investing billions of dollars. This whole project that surrounds you, that, that when you sort of piece together uh, in your imagination, it's extremely impressive. It's been going on for many generations, as we'll discuss. All of this comes from uh, uh, Descartes. It originates in him and Sir Francis Bacon, but in many ways it's only Descartes. Um, um, and all of these things are at the cost of other things. We believe in science. We have all of these research universities. All of this money pours into it. We believe that science somehow yields the truth. But there used to be other authorities uh, that other peoples in other times believed possessed the truth. Like the church, for example. Like scripture. It's only our prejudice that we've taken from Descartes, that we think that somehow science possesses the truth. It might not. Science may just be an illusion, a utilitarian illusion. It may not be able to answer any of the most fundamental questions. But nevertheless, we turn to it, uh, and we put our faith in it. And I think that this is the more subtle uh, uh, achievement of Descartes. Uh, and I think that, to a great degree, he's done this consciously. Uh, he has consciously, by changing these uh, institutions, by, by destroying the old, by giving us the new. He is reshaping, he has reshaped very successfully uh, our relationship uh, to eternity and the divine uh, and um, our self-understanding, as we're going to uh, 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 explain. Now, um, uh, Descartes also uh, is a, uh, of a peculiar influence on us as Americans. So I've described uh, this general big thing called modernity, and I suppose that Chris Lynch 
discuss with you guys that Machiavelli founds this thing that we call modernity. Um, but Descartes has a special contribution to us, uh, us Americans, because we are, the, in many ways, the regime that is modern par excellence. Uh, and um, and uh, Tocqueville, I think, is a very nice guide in explaining why Descartes matters so much to us as Americans, more than, for example, to Russians. I'm from Russia. I was, I, I was born there. Uh, Descartes doesn't really matter in Russia. Uh, Russia has uh, all of the tools of science, but it has adopted less of the prejudices that accompany modern natural science than we have. Uh, you guys read the Tocqueville reading, right, that Scott, that Scott assigned. So Tocqueville uh, says that um, uh, almost all the inhabitants of the United States direct their minds in the same manner and conduct them by the same rules. That is to say, they possess a certain philosophic method whose rules they have never taken the trouble to define that is common to them all. That is a very striking statement. Who, who already has read Descartes, like uh, Descartes, uh, Tocqueville, like the book, or most of the book, a couple of people? Yeah, uh, this is the beginning point of volume two. And all of volume two is a kind of response to Descartes, I think. And um, he sees this problem, that uh, we all have a philosophic method, uh, all Americans have the same model of intellect, and they don't know it, and it has a point of origin. And he goes on to say that America is the one country in the world where the precepts of Descartes are least studied, but best followed. So there's this uh, big problem, that we have an authority. All of our minds are modeled on that authority, but we're not even aware of it. And he wants to puzzle us. He wants us to inquire further, how can this be? We claim to be a free people. We claim to uh, be able to rule ourselves and conduct our lives as we please. But as it turns out, we're just governed by a prejudice. And we don't even know the origin of that prejudice. And he thinks that this is a very big problem. Um, he says that, uh, if I still go further and seek among these diverse features of this method, uh, the principal one that can sum up all the others, I discover that in most of the operations of the mind, each, America, each American calls only on the individual effort of his reason. So you guys have studied uh, now uh, Discourse on Method for a couple of weeks. Uh, do, you, do you guys see uh, wh where this comes from? Individual efforts of individual reason. This is how, he says, Americans specifically comport themselves. Um, uh, he thinks that this uh, Cartesian method has uh, affected our imaginations, our desires, our understanding of uh, morality, uh, that each man believes himself capable of seeking authority inside of himself. He thinks that this is uh, particularly, um, goes together particularly well with democracy, which is why it's been so successful in America. And again, not in places like Russia. Uh, uh, and the reason is uh, because um, Descartes favors somehow uh, 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 democracy. Uh, the method teaches that all human beings are equally capable of accessing the truth. Uh, and that very easily leads to the principle of believing in majorities, that majorities should rule. It's just a mathematical figure. If you are just as capable of accessing the truth, and you are just as capable of enlightenment, therefore, uh, as everybody else, wouldn't it mean that the plurality of intellects are somehow more enlightened than you, and smarter than you, and capable of accessing the truth? more than you, more than you as an individual. That, he says, is the dogma of democracies, the belief that somehow majorities possess wisdom. And he says it comes from uh, Descartes, uh, in part, or let's say Descartes' teaching is complementary with this uh, democratic prejudice, uh, because uh, we feel it. We feel that uh, a majority is somehow wiser, is somehow superior to ourselves. Uh, and this leads to this kind of um, uh, acceptance of majority wills, and we'll get back to that later. But uh, Descartes is particularly complementary to democracies, uh, and, and not in a good way, I think Tocqueville thinks, in a, in a, in a very bad way. And so, and so uh, we should be, you know, if we care about self-knowledge, we should in a way be terror-stricken at Tocqueville's statement, if he's right, that we are somehow ruled by an authority that we are not aware of, and yet, we boast of being free individuals. And so he invites us to look at 
what, what really is the origin of this authority? And who is Descartes? And so that's sort of what, what I want to do today. Um, that uh, Descartes occupies this enormous place in all of modernity, but he has a special place for Americans. Um, so the way to begin, I think, is to look at the discourse on method. Uh, that is um, uh, his most famous book, and it's supposed to be his most accessible book. Uh, it's written, it was written in French, and it was published anonymously. Uh, all, of, all of Descartes' other books were written in Latin. Uh, and this one is the only one that was written in French, in, as he says, the vernacular. You guys have seen this. Um, uh, there's a reason. For, does anybody want to try and uh, comment on why, why that is? It's a very important point to begin with. Anybody have any guesses? Yes? More people are able to read it. More can read it, yes. Who else? That's right. Yeah. Even the mediocre mind can. Exactly. That's right. It's a book for everybody. It's not a book for other geniuses. It's not really a book for the elites. It's a book for everybody. And uh, as, as we'll see in just a couple of moments, this is a very important strategy of his in bypassing the elites. He says in several places, you cannot attack their institutions directly. You will get bogged down. You have to circumvent them. And circumventing them is going to the common man, appealing to the common man. And this is why uh, Descartes frames himself as a common man. Um, He's not a common man. Does it, does it, after reading Discourse on Method, does anybody believe that he's a common man? Or after my introduction? No, he's anything but common. He's an epoch-making human being. You know, the kind that is produced only once every several centuries. An amazing intellect. Uh, he's not a common man. But he wants to, uh, if you want to create a revolution, he thinks, at least this kind of revolution, uh, you have to dissimulate and pretend to be common. Uh, that's the only way that uh, uh, the common man can stomach you. Uh, too much greatness is, is, is unstomachable. Um, now, um, yes, uh, too much greatness is unstomachable. Um, and uh, we in democracies have this impression of philosophers as, you know, these monkish scribblers or, uh, you know, pontificating madmen or you know, old, crusty professors or something like that. Um, that is uh, the image of, that democracy applies to philosophy. Um, uh, democracy does not want to see human greatness. It wants to make everybody a mediocrity. And it doesn't want to see these kinds of epoch-making human beings. Uh, philosophy is actually not about any of those images that we popularly have. Uh, it's about... Um, um, Men like Descartes, who are, um, how do I put this, uh, who are changing uh, uh, the course of history, who are uh, creating a new poetry to fall in love with, who are creating new heroes to fall in love with. There are new heroes all over his poetry. The, 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 the discourse on method, it, it's not just arguments. You know? There are, in a way, very few arguments. Uh, his genre is a kind of poetic philosophy. There are no heroes. There are no martyrs in it. Uh, Galileo is a martyr. Uh, Descartes himself is a kind of hero uh, who, who you are meant to fall in love with and imitate uh, if you want to achieve greatness. And in this way, this book is an attempt to replace uh, the old books that had a, uh, uh, the same kind of constellation of martyrs and heroes and moral teachings and articulations of you know, your relationship uh, to the universe. What is the book that he's trying to replace? This is an easy one. Yeah, this is a new Bible. This is a, a new story about uh, enlightenment, about genuine enlightenment, according to him. Um, it's a story uh, about um, you know, G Jesus goes through the world in his lifetime. Descartes goes through the world in his life. Um, the story of how his soul becomes philosophic, how it learns the good news, how he spreads the good news in turn, uh, except uh, with a couple of differences, obviously. Um, the, 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 the truth is contained inside of him, uh, and not in scripture, not from divine revelation. Uh, and uh, he's doing the same thing, I think, he thinks, as the Bible, creating a kind of religious revolution of a new religion, the new religion of science. And so I think that that is the broad, um, broadly what, what this book, how he understands 
uh, this book to be and how I think that uh, this book is meant to be read. Um, and in that regard, he's a poet. He's not just a philosopher arguing things out. He's a poet, and he's a poet with a political project, uh, as we said. Uh, a political project with uh, a very uh, important intention. And that intention is to bring uh, a new salvation to man with Descartes himself as the new benefactor. You guys follow this? The new salvation uh, will be uh, through a liberation from the old authorities, uh, uh, the universities, uh, the Bible, ultimately the Christian God, and um, uh, to bring in new benefits. And the new benefits are the fruits of science. That's what, uh, that's what I believe that he thinks he's doing. And since he's the originator of the new science, he's the new benefactor. And therefore, in this very odd and bold way, uh, he has a kind of rivalry with the old god, the god that he's trying to replace. Do you guys follow this? Does this make sense? Um, so that is all just by way of very general introduction to prove that uh, there's a motive, that there's an intention, that uh, philosophers are not just arguing about what he thinks is the truth. He'll never tell you what he thinks is the truth. You have, Machiavelli says, maybe Chris Lynch said this to you, Machiavelli says, I have, I, I have hidden my true opinions under so many lies that I sometimes don't know where I buried them. Descartes does the same thing. He will never tell you what he really thinks. Never. That's, what, that's why this is a form of poetry. A form of poetry to seduce you, to give you new images to love. They are never, these people, these people of this rank are never just arguing, you know, presenting what they really think before you so that you can judge it. Uh, they never do that for a, a, lot, of re a lot of good reasons. Uh, and so you have to dig. You have to dig. You have to find how he contradicts himself. You have to find how his arguments are sometimes end up in a dead end, but shouldn't, where he's not revealing what he really thinks. And then you have to add in and think through. You have to compare certain things that he says, one thing to another. Uh, see, see what is a more plausible account of things. Um, this, is his, this is his form of education. All of these great books are written on several levels, uh, one of which is to seduce, as I said, the poetic level. But then the other level is to cause you, to compel you, uh, to compel those that are the most worthy of thinking with them uh, to think. And the way to do that is, he says many, many times in this book, never give the answers. Uh, when you give the answers, you just create imitators who don't know the causes. The only way to learn is by thinking it through yourself. And somebody like Descartes can help you, can just uh, help you along the way and show you the puzzle pieces. And it's on you to put it together. So that's sort of what we'll, what, what we'll try to do here. Um, uh, I think the entrance point to doing that is to discussing the method. This is the thing that is in the title. It's the thing for which he's most famous. We all kind of know what the scientific method is. You know, we learned it in first grade, which uh, just shows that's another proof of how incredibly successful Descartes is. You know, all enlightened nations, all of their children, he even refers, we'll get to this in a second, he even refers to a child sitting there whose brain has been disciplined by the scientific method. And we are all products of that. We all have learned it already, you know, 400 years later. And the question is, does he think that the method is real or not? That's the real question. Whether he thinks that it genuinely yields the truth, that you, know, you put things through the method, like a sausage maker, and then out comes the truth, does he think that? Uh, or does he think that the method uh, should appear to do that? But in reality, there are other motives for creating it. There are other benefits that the method brings. You guys following this? Make sense? It's this kind of two-sided thing that we'll have to think through and, and, and weigh. Um, now, I'll give you guys a clue. We'll get into this. I mean, I obviously think the latter. I mean, I guess my gesticulation sort of proves that. Uh, but also, I, uh, the clue is that uh, he thinks that the method will solve several natural problems of man's condition or of man's nature. That, that's really what's at stake. And I think it's... Uh, good to discuss the reasons why the method is created before we actually get to the method. Now that's the order that he follows, and I think it's very important to follow that order uh, because he gives very strong arguments so that the method doesn't prejudice you later. 
You know, the method prejudices you when it's taught to you like it is in first grade or whatever grade we uh, 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 learn. It's just given to you, you know, as a kind of dispensation, like learn it and you'll be wise without looking at the justification. So that's what we'll do first. And then we'll discuss the method and then we'll return to Tocqueville. We're gonna try and figure out what the method is, why it exists, and then we're gonna to come to Tocqueville to observe, like, what has it done for us? Has it been good? Has it been fruitful? Has it fulfilled its promises? And it's complicated, right? It's, it's yes and no, and, and we'll try to think through that. Okay, so does that make sense where we're going? Where we've been so far, where we're going? Okay, so look, we can't tackle the entirety of the discourse. It's, it's short. It's only like 60 pages, but it's so complicated uh, and it's so subtly written that we have to sort of pick our point of entrance and hope that that's the right one. And I think it is, or maybe it is. Um, so my contention is that the method's purpose is to impose a new discipline over the senses, the imagination, and to bolster reason, which is naturally weak in human beings and deformed. That is its intention. And in doing so, in, in, in doing this process that I just described, uh, it should liberate us. Its point is to liberate us from the power that the passions have over us to some degree. Um, and it will liberate us as well from the various traditions and the gods uh, that have uh, distorted mankind. That, that I think is the goal and, and, and we'll get into the details. So the way to get into that, the way to figure out why he says that, what are these imperfections of nature, what, why the imagination, why the passions, he kind of leads us through it uh, in part two where he talks about the kind of imperfection of things. Do you guys remember this in part two? He talks about cities, perfection being created or not. We'll, I'll, I'll explain. Um, He's, uh, he says he's locked up in a room. Remember this? He's locked up in this room. And his first thought is about how perfection is generated. What are its origins? And ca can it be generated? Um, and uh, his goal will be uh, to create a perfection that he says doesn't hitherto exist and cannot be found. So doesn't hitherto exist means that Others have tried but failed, and cannot be found uh, is a question of whether nature creates things that are perfect, that are holes unto themselves. We'll, we'll, I'll, I'll explain what that means. Um, he uses the city as a metaphor for this. Remember this? The city. The, the city stands for two things. Uh, the first thing that this metaphor stands for is uh, he's giving you a kind of history of humanity. Humanity has gone through three stages, and the city is the metaphor for it. Uh, there was a savage state, there was a classical state, and there's a Christian state. Um, and uh, they have been incoherently mixed together. Uh, part of the proof of that is the kind of uh, uh, what Hobbes calls the Aristotility of Christianity, imposing ancients onto Christians, creating these disputations and concepts that are incoherent, driving, human driving civilizations into errors, according to Descartes. Um, and all of these things have just been built up by chance and imperfectly. They weren't ordered by a single person with a unified will and a unified intellect. It's just this passage of history that has happened by chance. And he says that uh, the outcome is just confusion. And uh, the method will play a central role in correcting this. It will impose a new order and it will rid this uh, accidental mixture of these, uh, of these eras and the alleged wisdom of these eras, it will purge them uh, 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 of their errors. And so his diagnosis of, of his um, uh, uh, era, the problem of it, the institutions that rule it, is that they use what's called probable reasoning. Do you guys remember this? He uses that expression only once or twice, but it's, it's, it's extremely important. You know, these, these great writers, and it's not when they repeat themselves that they're saying the most important thing. It's often when they just say something once. That's, that, that may be the most important place. And he's talking about probable reasoning. Um, and uh, what, what he means by this is um, 
This standard of probable reasoning is the standard of the scholastics that they've taken from Aristotle. Uh, have you guys read uh, Aristotle's Physics? For, for, no, okay, sorry. Uh, but this is this was this used to be. Well, look. Only one man on it. Yeah. Well, look. It's, well, look. It's it's actually this this is actually revealing, and in a way proves Descartes' success. We don't read that book. That book was read for a thousand years by all of the elites, and it was disputed over. Uh, talking about, for example, how many generations of people, hundreds of years, gener generations worth, have disputed over, you know, what is the real definition of motion? Now, how many, how many man, millions of man hours were lost in that, according to Descartes? Uh, talking about uh, the first principles of matter, its origins, all of this probable reasoning, probable as opposed to demonstrative. The universities were consumed by this. The priests were consumed by this. Um, and uh, you know, the, the fact that we don't read Aristotle anymore, uh, in a way, is a cause of his success, or it, it is, is a proof of his success. Um, um, talking about uh, you know, what are the principles of the soul? Uh, how do we know it? This is all probable reasoning. Probable because it can't be demonstrated. Uh, according to Descartes. Only certain things can be demonstrated. I'll, I'll tell you what, what they are. Um, and it was this kind of probable reasoning that ruled all of the main institutions. Uh, so the church, the universities. And he says that there's a, a, a very big problem in this. And it's a psychological problem. And it goes like this. That um, because you can never actually be contradicted, because you can never actually be proven wrong. All of these academics or priests or whatever one wants to call them, uh, they were given a lot of freedom. And in that freedom, their pride grew. And with the growth of their pride came uh, the deeper and deeper venture into obscurity. As I said, generations just arguing about what the definition of motion is. And uh, the problem of that is that uh, their pride, therefore, deformed their minds in such a way that uh, he says, a common man has more good sense than these people. And the reason is that a common man can be punished for his bad judgment. You make an error in how crops grow, the, season, the, the agricultural season is lost. These men are completely insulated from these kinds of things. They're like our uh, contemporary academics, disputating <laughs> over the most minor and paltry things, never being punished because they have tenure. Now, they actually have no uh, political power today. But what about in times when uh, the, this institution of essentially tenure was connected to ruling? What if professors ruled with all of their wise methodologies? Would, would that be good? Does anybody think that uh, they have a lot of common sense and you know, they have real insight into the nature of things and into the nature of politics or society? Or don't we laugh and call them eggheads? Uh, and, uh, and, and eggheads is a kind of lovable expression. And one only uses that lovable expression while they're just on the sidelines, not really ruling. Um, Descartes sees this as an enormous problem. And um, there are, maybe I'm miscounting, but I think that there are three basically um, particular political entities that are named in the book. Sparta, Amsterdam, and then the coronation, which he just attended, uh, of, of, of a prince. And this takes place during the Thirty Years' War. And so in a way, uh, there are a lot of like, you see uh, threads to trace out in this book. And one of these threads is how um, uh, he is living currently, or what, dur dur during this writing, uh, in the midst of this 30 years war, a religious war. Uh, a religious war that is based on disagreements over uh, uh, probable reasoning, over transubstantiation, for example. We don't even know what that means anymore. Uh, there were civilizations that, that, that destroyed one another for 30 years 
uh, over this kind of pr uh, probable reasoning. And so where he's going to take us is to Amsterdam. That's going to be the end goal. But it's going to be, uh, remember this, he says in, in, in book one, in part one, that he's in Amsterdam. And in Amsterdam, they, uh, uh, he can find tranquility of mind, and they honor contracts there. It's a commercial society uh, where a philosopher like himself can live peacefully. Uh, that's where he's going to take us. And he's going to take us there, uh, we'll talk about this in just a second, but by way of Sparta. Sparta, he's creating a, a kind of new Sparta. Um, so these disputations led to these terrible wars. Um, and uh, reason, he's suggesting with all of this, um, needs to be checked by consequences. It's when reason is uh, submitted, it's when reason in these free institutions is governed really by vanity and by pride and by um, um, a kind of rivalry with others to see who can be more holy, who can be more obscure, uh, because holiness is an obscurity in a certain way. It means you have special knowledge above anyone else. You know, you are more saved uh, in a way. Uh, that reason, uh, re reason is a, uh, cannot be trusted on its own. Reason does not just go to the truth. It serves. It serves other motives. Uh, and it must be checked. And so what will check reason? His method. Uh, his method will be designed uh, to uh, compel reasoning to go through steps in an orderly way so as to destroy these other motives, like pride and vanity. He thinks they'll still exist, but they will be um, subordinated to productivity. I'll, I'll explain what that means in just a second. Uh, demonstrative reasoning. So I gave you guys an example of what uh, prob probable reasoning is in, in his understanding. What is demonstrative reasoning? That's the kind that we use. Uh, what, what, is, what is at the end of uh, the appendix of the discourse on method? What, what is found there? Do you guys see it? What version were you guys using? The CSM? Yeah. Yeah, so at the end there's an appendix. Uh, and the appendix, nobody reads this anymore because it's kind of outdated, but that's okay. Uh, there's uh, an appendix on his, discovery, his discoveries in optics, meteorology, and geometry. That is demonstrative reasoning. That's the kind of reasoning that we believe in. Optics. How, how, how do optics work? What's, what's the, let's say, what's the mother science of optics? Yeah? Then they can reflect light. Yeah, geometry. The angles can be demonstrated. The lenses can be ground down. And you can prove that the geometric proofs are real. You know what focus is. You know the thickness of lenses. You know how they reflect, how they refract. Do you guys uh, hear about disputations in uh, optics today? Is there, is there anything to dispute? Uh, yeah, is there? Yeah, wavered particle, light. OK, OK, <laughs> true. Uh, but that's theoretical and abstract. In terms of its application, does anybody say, uh, like, oh, no, we should, uh, these lenses don't really work. You know, they only kind of work. Uh, that uh, the geometry is really all wrong. Nobody disputes that stuff. You just progress, and you get better and better. Uh, the, the, in, in a way, the facts are just the facts. Like, uh, the rudiments of optics uh, are uh, never disputed. Uh, there are not generations of scientists butting heads against one another without making any progress. Uh, same in meteorology. There are all sorts of theories. I mean, go, going to your point, there are, are a lot of theories. But like, are there real disputations on like, you know, the, the very basics of meteorology, of you know, wind patterns, uh, uh, how tides work, these kinds of things? Not really. There are not people wasting their life, lifetimes uh, disputing that in a way that uh, there were disputations over, as I said, the definition of motion. It can be demonstrated. There's a hypothesis, and then it can be demonstrated in a laboratory or in the laboratory of the world. And that's where it ends. It does not go further. 
in that way, it progresses. It goes forth. Uh, that's the kind of uh, uh, new reasoning that he wants. Uh, bad science is debunked like this in months or, or sometimes years. It's very rare that bad scientific theories you know, go on and circulate for generations and generations, uh, unless they were good until they were surpassed, like relativity, uh, surpassing uh, uh, Newtonian physics. Um, uh, so the conclusion of, of this little section is that uh, he wants to create a new standard of reasoning, and this new standard of reasoning, the purpose of it, the underlying purpose of it, is to uh, 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 bolster reason that is not naturally strong in us, that is actually guided by pride and vanity and various fears and hopes uh, that uh, have uh, deformed his world uh, in the way that I've described it. Uh, a religion uh, that has uh, institutions that guard themselves, that create these kinds of wars that are non-productive. Uh, he wants to get rid of this kind of stuff. And he thinks that it doesn't serve man. It doesn't serve man's purposes. It doesn't serve his ends. And in a way, look, uh, it's like I've said in the sciences, but it's true. Uh, where, do you guys know examples of places where there are still, you know, age-old disputations over metaphysical concepts that animate a whole society. That only happens in, in, in theocracies, in the Middle East. Not, not really anywhere else. That whole class, all of those institutions, out the door, tossed out over several generations. Um, now, my second point, so that's point number one. My second point about why, again, our, our research question is why he thinks a new method is necessary. What problems in nature are being corrected? And here is uh, the second point that I want to make. This list is, by the way, not exhaustive. Uh, there are other points that could be made, and, uh, and I'd like to hear what you guys think. Uh, but uh, there, there are other points that can be made, but, but I think that these are two uh, very important ones. Um, now, the second point is that comes from a problem that is basically unavoidable, save for uh, uh, where miracles are possible. And that is that we are all born children. This, he thinks, is a defect. Adam and Eve uh, are uh, born perfect. They don't go through adulthood. Uh, excuse me, they don't, don't, they don't go through childhood. But all other human beings are born children. And this is a major problem. It sounds silly. I know that it sounds silly. Uh, but it's not. Uh, here's why it's not. Because, um, as it turns out, because we're born children, we're born uh, divided between two authorities which vie for control over us. And those two authorities are appetites and uh, the opinions that we get from teachers. And we're born uh, a kind of blend. We develop for a long time as a blend of these two things vying for control over us at the cost uh, of our reason. Uh, the fact that we're these kind of composite beings uh, means that we're like the cities that we described before. We're imperfect. We're born imperfect. We're not born wholes. And so nature, or God, whichever one he means, uh, in us at least, in the example of us human beings, doesn't create us uh, as, or, or let's say create us, creates us imperfectly. And so during these pre-rational adolescent years, um, we are born uh, divided, and these two forces, he says, are, quote, often opposed. So often, not always. They're often opposed. And later, uh, in part three of the discourse, Descartes tells us a little bit about uh, the character of, of these teachers of opinion. Who are they? Uh, and they, too, are composites. The teachers. They give us opinions. And the teachers are composites. Um, laws slash customs. And then religion. Uh, 
So the question is, uh, of course, if the teachers are composites, are they also imperfect, like the opinions that they give us? And are these two things uh, in accord with one another? And then the question would be, which actually rules which? Do these come from this? Or does this come from this? Or is it actually, a, uh, is it a kind of impossible blend that only becomes uh, per perfected in one example that he gives, which is Sparta? We'll come to that in a second. So uh, we, uh, from childhood, are informed, our opinions come from teachers, and those teachers themselves may be, may be uh, incoherent. They are often opposed. Uh, and uh, of course, these opinions, they inform our imagination. How? What do these things make us imagine? What does this make us imagine? Yeah, that's good. That's really great, because that's what he's ultimately trying to do, to destroy the unattainable. Did you guys uh, talk about chapter 15 of The Prince, Imaginary Republics? Yeah, uh, they inform the imagination. Uh, and and, and, and what, so what, what is that imaginary republic for Descartes and Machiavelli? Heaven, hell, uh, all sorts of things. They animate the imagination. And so, are you guys following this so far? So, uh, this is a boy, or a little girl. We don't know, it can decide its gender later. <laughs> <laughs> and this little boy has this little body. And this little body has appetites and desires. And then, into this little mind, before reason is active, come these things, these opinions. And they are in conflict often with this body. Follow this? And so this is a very big problem for Descartes. For, for Descartes. For you. You know, if you're a human being, this is a major problem. Um, and man is governed by both of these things, he says. Um, uh, neither of which, he says, quote, gave us the best advice. <laughs> Very delicate way of saying it. Uh, that means that neither has wisdom. Neither uh, has self-understanding, he says. Um, and the point of his project, the reason that he gives this little metaphor for this little boy or girl, is to make these two things coherent. And because you can't get rid of the body, that's there to stay. Well, unless you believe the transgender movement, I suppose. <laughs> that, 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 well, that's a serious point, that that actually can be transformed. Don't trans, this is kind of anti-Cartesian. Don't transform the imagination. What you imagine to be yourself, your gender, don't change that. That is perfection. So ignore this whole critique, you know? <laughs> ignore all the philosophy. Uh, but what we can change through Cartesian science is, you know, the, this little area. And this little area determines all of this, all brain. Sorry, that's a getting off topic. Um, so, um, uh, now, uh, the opinions that the teachers uh, give us uh, are necessary, he says, uh, because uh, when you're born, you're born, I'm going to have a child soon, and I've seen other children before. And children are not very smart. <laughs> They're not. It's just nature. You're born weak and stupid. Uh, that's, that's just how we're brought into the world. And so you need opinions when you can't reason on your own. And so these opinions have to enter necessarily. It can't be a human being without opinion. They have to enter necessarily. And so uh, the question will be for Descartes, how long these bad opinions last? Is it for a little while? Or like for most people, probably forever? 
Uh, they are just there. It is, it, it is nature to need opinions. It is nature to, to, to have a body that you can't get rid of. So what we can do uh, is we can change uh, uh, the, the teachers. And we can try and purify this incoherence. Are, are you guys following this so far? Is, is this making sense? Okay. Um, Uh, and so, th this is the question: If, uh, if human beings, if this analysis, uh, look, this is a one-hour-long lecture. It is very short, and there is a lot of detail here. And this book took a genius many years to write. So, like, we're not going to get out all the details, and we're not going to get out the whole argument. But uh, if you accept this very general argument of what is wrong with the way in which we are brought into the world then there are necessary reflections on why that is the case. And uh, it is either a problem of, uh, let's say the religious answer is fallenness. We were born perfect, and we are no longer born that way. And all of this kind of confusion is the consequences of God's punishment. Explanation number one. Explanation number two, which is the Cartesian explanation. Um, nature, which is what produces this thing called a human being, it's a body, just like nature produces calves and frogs in species, it produces this species too. That species uh, is born um, imperfectly because nature is unkind to us. Nature is not beneficent towards us. Nature, maybe that means that nature is indifferent to us, I don't know. That's a, a, an important question that I don't know if I can answer. But it is certainly not kind to us, because it, uh, uh, it in a way, uh, damns us into this condition that needs a remedy. And the reason that it needs a remedy is because, as I've said, those uh, arguments about those former cities and this kind of uh, history of humanity, that is not a history of happiness. That is not a, that is not a history of human happiness and of human wholeness. And Descartes wants to create a new kind of wholeness. Um, and that new kind of wholeness will be brought about uh, through a human art. How are we doing on time? We got some time. 15 minutes, yeah. Oh, that's it, okay. Well, let me, let me hurry through that. Um, he's gonna bring about a, a new wholeness by making uh, coherent our appetites and, and, and our teachers. And he himself is going to be uh, the new teacher. Uh, and he wants, uh, uh, and, and he'll teach us through the method, which we're going to get into right now. Um, uh, he will teach us through the method, and he'll replace uh, all of these old teachers. He will give us new opinions, and he will try to make these two things coherent with one another. Uh, satisfying natural appetites from the body, um, destroying impossible hopes, uh, like you've just said uh, a moment ago, uh, and um, he uh, wants it to be such that we will not conceive plans beyond our powers. That's a quote from him. We will no longer conceive plans beyond our powers. Um, and um, let's leave it there and go on to the method. Um, so what is this method? Uh, uh, it, it will improve all of this. It will improve a lot of things. And it will bring a, a new enlightenment and a new epoch. Uh, and uh, uh, he thinks that uh, he wants um, all countries to follow this. All human beings, everyone, will follow this new method. It is a cosmopolitan method. And it will destroy all of these differences between cultures if it's successful. Uh, and its purpose is to create a new custom of the mind, uh, he says. You should track this word custom. Uh, in his work, it's it's probably the most the most important work uh, to a custom, to create a custom, uh, to adopt a custom, and he says that this new method is going to be modeled on the best elements of geometry and algebra. And there are four uh, there are four parts to it, and uh, I want to go through them, uh, and um, I want to summarize them myself, and then I want to show you what I think are, are uh, is the purpose or the implication of this part the method. And this, excuse me, this method is meant to apply to two things. One is actual scientists. 
So people that will use this method to uh, discover things in material nature. But he also wants this method to be adopted as our new custom. This is the old custom. This is the old custom. And then he wants to give us a new custom. So the old custom, the model of the old custom is the Bible. And the model of the new custom is what? Geometry and algebra. That's the, that's the model. Um, okay. So number one is accept as true only what is evidently true. Namely, what presents itself to the mind clearly and distinctly. Okay, so what, what, what does that mean? That's my sort of reformulation of it. Uh, that means that um, no reliance on authority outside of one's reason. No tradition, perhaps no scripture. Reason alone. Uh, it means that uh, also, the, the other implication is that uh, uh, all individuals in principle are capable of reasoning about all things. It's democratic. Uh, there is no longer special access that is necessary. Who had special access to special mysterious knowledge? Priests. And prophets. Forget that. Uh, that is not a true standard, uh, the implication says. Um, nobody will have exclusive knowledge. Uh, reason, and because this is a, a faculty that all of us possess, and because it's through that faculty that the truth, whatever he means by that, is accessed. Uh, it means that everybody can access it. Two, divide every difficulty into as many parts as is possible and necessary. Um, in other words, the mind will impose order onto the world. So uh, it, when Aristotle uh, talks about motion, uh, it's the opposite. It's that you have to observe um, the, um, the being at work and staying the same of biological species in order to understand their form and their final cause. It is in the phenomena. Descartes doesn't say that. Uh, he says that uh, every difficulty, divide, divide, you are acting. The mind is actively doing a thing. Divide every difficulty into as many parts as possible and necessary. Necessary for what? I don't know, your utility or the discovery of the truth. It's not clear uh, what is necessary. Um, the point is that the world, in a way, does not come ordered. Uh, or the previous orders can't be trusted, as is shown in cities. Um, and that, too, may be true in material nature. And chemistry is, in a way, an example of this. Um, you know, we have a periodic table of elements. We have found out uh, all of the elements that are available in the world. And do we just uh, you know, observe them in nature? Say that, look, uranium occurs here. Uh, and it's somehow uh, uh, perfect insofar as nature creates things perfectly. And where that uranium is housed is somehow necessary. It shouldn't be touched. It shouldn't be tortured or used. Same thing with all other things. Oil in the ground. Um, trees, forests growing. They're somehow spontaneous and perfected because there's an overall order to nature. No. Chemistry doesn't say that at all. Modern chemistry doesn't say that at all. It says that we have to identify these elements, and we have to, to use Bacon's word, torture them, or to use uh, 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 Descartes' word, uh, become lords, masters over these things. We have to figure out what's really inside of them, all of their little particles. We have to change them. We have to alter them. We have to blow them up in particle accelerators. So as to find the thing that we're looking for. And what are we looking for? It's not clear, but it's utility, broadly, man's use. There is not a natural end. There is no telos. There is no uh, order to which we have to subordinate ourselves to and revere in nature, in material nature. It should be used for our benefit. Uh, third. The third rule deals with um, the order of thinking. Begin with the simplest objects, and thus the ones easiest to know. Ascend to the most composite. Uh, that means taming the imagination. 
Uh, it means uh, you begin rationally and not fantastically. You begin with simple bodies. You don't rush to God and say, uh, here's his essence, here are his powers. Clearly we've demonstrated that he's omnipresent uh, and omnipotent. No, simple bodies, simple bodies that all can grasp, like geometry. You can know the rules, you can know the laws, they're simple, and they can be taught uh, to everybody. Uh, fourth, uh, to make thorough enumerations and surveys in order to avoid leaving things uh, out of account. Um, what that means is um, thoroughness means that there will be generations and generations that work out problems and make progress. Uh, not just uh, generations in one country, generations throughout the world. My uncle is a physicist, and uh, I, I have a Google Alerts on my name, and he has the same last name as me, and it's like always him. Uh, always him being cited in some kind of article. He does space physics, and the languages of the citations are totally different. Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Russian, Spanish. It's the world throughout all citing one another, all building on one another's work. The thoroughness of this, uh, that's the broad thing. But the, the, the basic thing is that um, uh, in, in the rules of the mind, you cannot proceed uh, without making demonstrations and proofs. It tames hopes, it tames imaginations. You have to be methodical. Um, and uh, the, so we, we talked a lot about children today. And there are a couple of uh, mentions of children. So the first one I gave you guys. And then the second one, there's another child, if you guys remember this. And this, what? Sparta. It's, no, 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 it's, it's after Sparta. It's after Sparta. It's after he introduces the method. There's a second post-method child. And uh, this post-method child is just sitting there doing mathematics. And he's applying the method. And the method has subordinated uh, him to uh, proceeding methodically, carefully. There's no imagination anymore. He's just following the rules of geometry. And that's the post-method child. He will become orderly. He's not ordered. I don't have an answer. I don't know if Descartes thinks that uh, this kind of coherence is ever possible in anybody but him. But somebody who has thought fully through this and, and, and this, that's what, that's what it would take. But what you can do is you can have an improvement over what we have. And that child is the kind of generic improvement, the second child that's mentioned. One whose passions have been dimmed, his reason has surfaced over them because he has learned to uh, apply a method and because he has accustomed himself. He has developed a new custom, a habit. You guys follow this? This makes sense? Um, okay, well, we're running out of time, uh, so uh, I will uh, go to uh, Tocqueville very briefly, very briefly. Um, there's this one quote that I really want to read you guys. It's from a, a professor at the University of Chicago who's now dead, uh, Joseph Cropsey, wrote a very good article, and this is the last paragraph in it, and it's uh, really like dead on. He says, it is clear that Descartes expected his project hence his thought and his reason, to live on in the minds and lives of untold generations. This is the method. In this way, perhaps, his rational soul lives on, long surviving his extinction. You guys follow that? It's in that boy. Descartes lives insofar as Descartes is his thought, and insofar as his thought, in the current context, is his method. It lives on. That is what eternity is for Descartes or for a philosopher like him. That is what glory is. That he lives on in each of your souls through this method that he has taught you. This method that you are unconscious of, uh, but that has ordered your minds and has ordered your lives uh, and, has, and, has taught, and has taught you, you know, what your relationship is to the whole. So, Tocqueville. Um, the question is for Tocqueville, uh, he knows Descartes backwards and forwards. He knows discourse on method. He knows it better than I will ever understand it. 
And uh, what he's asking is, uh, is this world that Descartes has made, to borrow a phrase from Professor Yenner, uh, inhabitable for human beings? Can human beings live in the world? This new order uh, that Descartes has promised, with its new fruits, its new characters, its new martyrs. Uh, and Descartes is skeptical. Uh, Descartes. Tocqueville is very skeptical. Uh, he doesn't see that it has brought about human happiness. And uh, as I mentioned to you in the beginning, I believe that volume two is a response to Descartes, the whole volume. And it's like one of these things uh, that I mentioned before. When a philosopher says something, he just needs to say it once for it to be of monumental importance. He need not repeat himself. And so you can see the organization of all of volume two, it begins with Descartes. It begins from those quotes. And then everything else, I believe, is a kind of explanation of to use Machiavelli's uh, word, the word that you guys, I think, studied a lot already, the effectual truth of Descartes' teaching. He wants to see how it manifests itself in the world. And he thinks that America is a, a wonderful place to do that. It is where it has manifested itself most fully. Um, and he says, Tocqueville says in the beginning, I guess you guys have read this, that, that Descartes and Bacon uh, have abolished the received formulas destroyed the empire of traditions and overturned the authority of the master. Who is the master? Yeah, the church and who the church represents, the Christian God. <coughs> so, he, so the, 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 Tocqueville is saying that Descartes has been successful in precisely the thing that Descartes wanted to be successful. And so we're going to see what the results are. And he has a critique. And since we're running out of time, I can't go into it uh, in much detail. We can do this in the q and I suppose. Um, He's very precise in mapping out uh, specifically how this method, he even calls it a method, uh, has affected science, politics, religion, and let's say the human soul, a word that Descartes uses only once uh, in the Discourse on Method, but that Tocqueville uses all the time. And that in itself is a kind of clue of, of, of how Tocqueville is overturning, trying to overturn what Descartes has done. No soul, lots of soul. Um, first of all, he says that um, this stuff about doubting, this stuff about living in skepticism is nonsense. And it has been popularized and vulgarized, especially through people like Voltaire. But it has done a terrible disservice to human beings. It may be a philosophic method. It may be a scientific method. But it doesn't apply to societies and to individuals. It doesn't apply to societies because to have a uh, common action, you have to have common belief. And it is impossible, therefore, to have a country of all skeptics. That's not a country. Con countries like that are just invaded and dissolved. Uh, number one, doesn't apply. Number two, uh, individuals. Well, it may work in the privacy of your little wood-burning stove room for a genius, uh, but it doesn't work for common individuals, he says. Uh, here's what happens. What happens is um, you pretend to doubt everything. But nobody can live like that. You cannot go through your whole life just proving every small thing uh, because you have to live. Life requires action. And so what you end up doing in a time when all of the old authorities have been destroyed, poetry has been destroyed, uh, literature has been destroyed, uh, uh, the church has been destroyed, religious traditions have been destroyed, all authorities that used to guide us and tell us, uh, give us opinions. And some of those opinions had genuine wisdom in them. They weren't all, as Descartes exaggerates, just hocus pocus nonsense. Some of them had genuine wisdom. When all of that's destroyed and human beings are convinced that, uh, that, that sovereign opinion lies only in them, but what happens is that they're actually not intelligent. They're mediocrities, just like, just like Descartes says himself. The world is full of mediocrities, not full of geniuses. And so what happens is when all of those opinions are destroyed, what do you, what do you rely on? What does Tocqueville say? The government, right? Well, hold on. We're going to get there. Yes. Public opinion. Just the opinion of the majority. You claim to be independent. You claim to be intelligent. But those are all vain, empty boasts. You just believe in public opinion. That's the authority that guides you. And public opinion, in Tocqueville's mind, is one of the most uh, foolish things that, that, that has ever existed. And it has only existed in the way that it exists in modern democracies, which Descartes helped to bring about. 
Um, so what you have is actually proud, vain, little private individuals who boast about their independence and who are actually dogmatic and slavish to public opinion. So that's part number one. What about religion? Um, Descartes has destroyed trust in religion, and with that has gone any kind of connection to a real eternity. Uh, do, do you guys wake up in the morning and think to yourself, like, uh, what's, what's going to come of my soul? What's going to come of my eternal soul? No. Have you guys proven to yourself that there's no soul? No. It's just a dogma. Right now in America, uh, the dogma is that uh, 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 religion is, you know, we should be skeptical of it, it doesn't really exist. And so everybody just goes that way. Maybe you should be thinking about your divine soul. Maybe it's realer than anything else in you, but you haven't proven that to yourself. You don't believe right now because the majority doesn't believe right now. But a hundred years ago, you would have just been the opposite. Everybody would have believed and you would have just believed. And so uh, what Tocqueville is getting at is that um, uh, this method has disconnected you from any kind of serious reflection on what eternity is and what mortality is and what your duties are in life. And that has made you a shallow non-entity that is prepared to be tyrannized in the first place by public opinion and then by the state, as we'll get into it in a second. Um, he also says that science uh, um, gives us uh, uh, an impression that there's no order to the cosmos. He says that, uh, you guys remember this, well maybe, there's this example of a ship, he talks to this crude sailor, he says, a vulgar sailor, that's a quote, and he says that, uh, uh, he asks him, look at that beautiful ship. Uh, and the sailor says, uh, that ship is not beautiful. That is just a temporary ship. Uh, as science progresses, we'll have new ships. That'll be better. And the comment is that, um, uh, can you believe in the beautiful if you believe in science? Does the beautiful mean that there is a permanent order that can be known, that loves you, that is beneficent towards you? The science teach you the opposite. The science teach you that there's just, like we say, there's an expanding universe, and the stars is gonna blow up, or you know, whatever. Do you guys know that? I mean, just some scientific authority says that. What if there are miracles? And like, that's just not true. You can't prove that, or maybe some of you can. You don't know these things, but science gives you these impressions. Uh, and these are not impressions that ennoble man uh, that beautify his life, that teach him, as I said, about his duties, the purpose of his existence. Uh, they teach you that you're just a body, and you, like that star, will just explode, and you're meaningless. And that's what science has given man. And the last thing is that uh, Descartes thought for Tocqueville, they, am, I, am I over? Finish up. Okay, th th this is the last point. Uh, th 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 Descartes basically thought that uh, he could uh, rid man of the prejudices or the hopes and fears that make him attached to God. And uh, the whole commentary at the end of volume two about the state uh, shows that that's not possible. That's the purpose of that uh, critique. That actually, yeah, you get rid of uh, all of the traditions, heaven and hell and all of these things, but you still have man that longs for a God and longs for an eternity, and that manifests itself in a state. The state will be the thing that is considered uh, omnipotent, and beautiful, the thing that can satisfy your desires, the thing that you look up to, and you being a small, uh, uh, deracinated, individuated uh, Democrat that still needs to believe in an eternity, and will see uh, eternity in the state. And that state, rather than sending you to heaven, heaven or ennobling you and teaching you about your duties, uh, what it will actually do is it will um, uh, degrade you uh, and take away your intellect and your capacity to think for yourself. Uh, and. Uh, that is Tocqueville's critique of Descartes, uh, very quick, very briefly. Um, well, th thank you, Arthur. Let's take, take to the big hands on the sticks, and we'll come back and have Q&A and talk about part six.